Well, aloha, everyone, and welcome back to Human Biology here at Chaminade University. Today we are going to be discussing the muscular system, which is Module 7A. So an overview of the muscle system. So what's the purpose of the muscle system? Well, it helps with posture and body motion and body position. It works in conjunction with the bones to be able to move your body around. It's innervated by nervous tissue, and that's going to then fire the muscles. The muscles then make the bones move. It's also going to allow the motion of your internal organs, so a lot of your internal organs are muscular organs as well, and it's going to be involved in moving your blood, so your heart, for example, is going to move all the blood around the body, so it's going to regulate your blood flow as well as the production of heat within the body. We have three major types of muscles. The first here is cardiac muscle or heart muscle. Then we also have smooth muscle as well as skeletal muscle. So cardiac muscle we'll start with first. It's going to be um, separated from each other with these intercalated discs. We're going to have a lot of nuclei per. Now nuclei are kind of like the boss of the cell and because these cells are really complicated. They're going to need several different bosses. Um, we also have what's called striations or little linings among them. You have striations. So it's a striated tissue with intercalated discs in between. And it all moves in concert. So the cardiac muscle is going to have one region that's going to get innervated and then it's going to, it's called a node. And that's going to spread out. So we go from one node to, to the second node. And between those two nodes, the entire muscle is going to be beating. So each node does one does the lub, the other does the dub. And that allows for the contractions of the heart. All right. Um, we also have smooth muscle here. Again, this is a good example of what we might find in like the urinary bladder or in the uterus and um, in the intestines. Smooth muscle is going to be aligned with many cell, small cells all aligned together. We've got one nucleus per, which is highly organized, but not striated, no intercalated discs. Okay, skeletal muscle, on the other hand, is involved in voluntary motion. So these are both involuntary motion, right? You can't change how quickly your heart beats. Although I could, or a doctor could, if they were to give you epinephrine, for example, or um, horse tranquilizers like ketamine or something like that might slow your heart rate down. But you can't consciously control it, although you could control it with pharmaceuticals. Um, skeletal muscle is going to be something we are under voluntary control. So if you choose to pick up your pen or to type into your computer, etc., And these guys are going to, again, be highly innervated and when the nerves fire they're going to cause muscular contractions which then causes the bones to move. So that's kind of an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. All right so if we have muscles again in the heart this is going to be cardiac tissue. The cardiac tissue is going to be involuntary part of the autonomic nervous system which is going to be involved in something that's basically a process that is taken care of without your conscious control. Um, the cells in the cardiac tissue, cardiac muscular tissue are going to be branched. They have intercalated discs between them, um, multinucleated, up to three nuclei per cell. They're striated, and it's an immediate contraction speed. What do I mean by that? I mean that as soon as it gets that impulse to contract, they all contract in concert. And this is so important for maintaining that contractile rhythm of the heart. Okay, so smooth muscle here, going to be found in your blood vessels, your digestive tract, bronchial tubes, uh, in the sphincters of some of your organs, um, like your, for example, your urinary sphincter, as well as the iris of your eye, which allows for the contraction of your pupil if we end up with too much light. This is all also under involuntary control. You are not responsible for these items, although your body is, but you yourself are not, right? You can't choose to. Again, it's all autonomic nervous system, which is something that's taken care of for you. These are small cells that are going to function as a multi-unit group with, con with connections of gap junctions, but there's only one nuclei per, um, and they're not striated, they're small, and the contractile speed is going to be very slow. Think the process of digestion, for example. Okay, but muscle tissue, or that skeletal muscle tissue, is going to be connected to the nervous system as well as to the skeletal system. It's voluntary. You can choose to pick up that pencil or not, and it's under the control of the somatic nervous system. The cell structure is that we're going to have long parallel cells. These are going to be motor units that function kind of together. And we can start firing very, just a small amount of those motor units if we want to have very dexterous tissue, like write, fine writing with a pen, or large motor units if we want to have something very strong occurring. So if we wanted to pick up something heavy. Um, a, fun fa a fun fact, you can't do both. So if you pick up something heavy and then try to write with a pen, it's almost impossible. So try it if you want to. Go ahead, pick up something heavy in your hand, and then try at the same time to use your fingers to write your name and it's going to look like a child did it because it's really difficult to use the small motor units when you're already calling in the entire large motor units. 
Um, okay, it's going to be, we're going to have large, intermediate, and small to fibers. So we have three different types of fibers, again, for dexterity or for strength. And we can have multiple different types of contraction. We can have slow, sustained contraction, intermediate contraction, or fast contraction that we can do in a very quick fashion. All right, so when we look at the muscle cells, we're going to call them muscle fibers. And muscle fibers start off as myoblasts. That's a precursor cell during development. So blast means it's going to turn into, in this case, myo meaning muscle cell. And because we fuse many of them together during this developmental part, all the nuclei become into one cell so we can end up multinucleated. And this is really important. As I mentioned, we have many bosses because it's such a big series of, it's such a big undertaking. So it's not a small business that needs one boss. It needs many different bosses. So the multiple nuclei help make sure that everything moves smoothly. They also do not undergo cell division, so they're terminally differentiated. That means that once they become skeletal muscle cells, they stay skeletal muscle cells forever, do not reproduce, and eventually will die off. So they will have to be regenerated or replaced. Um, that's going to come from something called stem cells. Stem cells or satellite cells are going to be the cells that are going to create new muscle cells. Um, and this, as we age, we're going to get less and less of these, so we're going to have a harder time replenishing the muscles. Hypertrophy can happen, so hypertrophy means large in size, so hypertrophy occurs when muscle cells get larger and larger, um, but as they get larger they might not function properly, so just because they're very big doesn't mean that they're working well. Muscle tissue is going to be um, something that's given the trigger to grow by different hormones such as insulin growth factor, growth hormone, and other types of sex hormones. Okay, so you probably know this by now, but just to review, ligaments attach bone to bone, and muscles attach, are attached to bone by tendons. So tendons attach muscles to bones. So dense connective tissue called a tendon connects muscle to bone. Dense connective tissue called a ligament connects bone to bone. Um, now, muscles can be attached with really long tendons. For example, things like um, tendons are going to run all the way through the forearms into the fingers. So fingers move because of very teeny tiny skinny tendons that run all the way through the muscles in the forearm. Um, so tendons can attach a long distance away or they can attach close by as well. So here's a cross section of the skeletal muscle. If we look at this whole thing together, the outside is going to have the epimesium. It's going to surround the whole muscle. The paramecium is going to surround this fascial and the endomesium is going to surround a myofibril. So these are all wrapped, they're all different layers of like saran wrap to surround these different muscles, but we do it at different layers of, so this epimesium does the whole thing at once, paramecium just the fascial, and this endomesium surrounds the myofibril. Okay, if we're looking inside the myofibril, here's one myofibril, it consists of many different filaments put together surrounded by this sarcoplasm area. The sarcoplasm area is an area where we're going to have um, calcium that's going to be able to sit there, which is waiting to be sent, get a trigger to flood, and when it floods, it's going to cause contraction. We'll talk about that when we get to contraction, but the sarcoplasm is an area, or the sarcoplasm particulum is an area where we're going to be storing that calcium. All right, so we have a athlete named Dave. He's doing squats. He's doing five sets of six with eight repetitions, sorry, of six to eight repetitions per set. What are the lower body muscles involved in doing a squat that are shown in this illustration? Is it going to be aerobic or anaerobic? What are the type of muscle fibers used? What is the source of the production of ATP? And would creatine be a useful supplement? So we can consider this as we move forward, and they'll resolve this as we get towards the end of the lecture. Okay. This is a table of the different types of muscles in the body and a name, uh, the different names that you might see of the muscles in the body and the definitions. Basically a Latin translation for you. Maximus means largest, minimus, smallest. Major and minor are just larger and smaller. Um, if it's long, it might be called longus. Um, if it's going to be parallel to the midline, it's called rectus. And if it's perpendicular to the midline, it's called transverse. If it's diagonal, uh, diagonal to the uh, midline, it's going to be considered oblique. Um, anything that allows us to flex, i.e. decreases the joint ankle, it's called a flexor. Anything that allows us to extend, i.e. up on like tippy toes, that increases the joint ankle, that's called an extensor. Anything that takes our uh, body like, and takes the arms away from the midline, for example, it's called an abductor if we're lifting the arms up using that muscle. 
Um, if it's going to move it back towards the midline, it's called an adductor. Sometimes they're going to be described by the shape. So here's a deltoid is triangular, trapezius is trapezoid. And sometimes we discuss it by how many oranges it has. Does it have two origins? It's a bicep, three origins, tricep, four origins, quadricep. So there's multiple different ways that we describe these, but we're literally just using descriptive terms. What size are they? Where do they run? What kind of angles do they create? Are they moving towards or away the midline? What is their shape? How many origins do they have? So a lot of it are just descriptive terms when we were originally dissecting the human body and figuring out where all of it worked. We were just basically saying, aha, this increases joint angular. It's going to be an extensor, right? So once you start recognizing a lot of these different terms, you'll be able to understand the muscles a little bit more. Okay. In order for a muscle to work, i.e. move a bone, it's going to have to go across at least one joint. If the muscle was connected at one point of the same bone to the, from one point here to point B on the same bone and it contracted, all it would do potentially is break the bone, but probably it wouldn't do anything because it might not be strong enough to do that. So in order for us to move bones, we have to connect at one location and at the other. In fact, some of these muscles are going to cross two bones, two joints, like this one here that's going to be connected here at the scapula and also at the radius. It skips the humerus entirely at both joints. What does it do? It's going to pull the radius up towards the scapula, right? That's how the biceps works. The bicep has two origins and one insertion, so it's called biceps, right? So again, there's a couple of different things that we look at when we look at how it works. One of them is the point of origin and the point of insertion. The insertion of muscle is going to be connected on the bone that moves. So if you're contracting something and you realize that what you're doing is pulling the radius up towards you, then this acromion, the scapula itself is not going to be moving, right? So this is going to be the insertion point because that's the part that moves, and the unmoving bone, bone is called the point of origin. And again, with the biceps, we have two points of origin, right? Which means that here on the insertion point that are able to move that radius. So that's why we call it bicep. Okay? All right, take a deep breath. We're in for the long haul now. On the left, we have the anterior of the human body or the front. On the right, we have the posterior of the human body or the back. I'm going to start at the top of the head and we're going to work our way down. This here is called the occipital frontalis. It runs along the frontal bone um, and it connects at the back at the occipital bone here. So here's the occipital frontalis here. It has a little teeny tiny occipital belly. So in the front, it has this frontalis region and in the back, it has an occipital belly at the very back and then the rest of it is just kind of going to be a long tendon sheath that runs over the top of your head underneath the hairline. These guys here that run around the eye socket, they're called the orbicularis oculi or they're the muscles that make the orbit of your ocular cavity. This muscle here is the masseter. It's involved in chewing or mastication. Here's the orbicularis oris, which goes around the mouth. So orbicularis just means runs around. Oris, in this case, is mouth. Um, so here we have the, I also want to point out here that on the left, we're going to be showing the deep muscles here, and on the right, the superficial muscles. So on this side, the pl plasmata has been removed in order to show us the sternocleomastoid, which connects from the back of the neck to the sternum and the trapezius, which is going to be part of the upper arm. In the front here, these are the pecs. We have the pectora, pectoralis major, or major, right? They're going to be pulling across. And then also as we move into the arm, we have the deltoid at the top of the shoulder. Moving down, we have the, um, so the, this is serratus is actually pointing here towards the belly. So moving down the arm, we're going to be looking at the biceps brachii. Next, the brachialis is here. The triceps is going to be towards the back. We're going to see it better when we're looking um, here. Triceps brachii, more like that. Again, with three sets of origin. Um, and then down as we move past here, we have the brachioradialis, which is going to be running down the radius. And here's the flexor carpi, carpi radialis, which allows us to help move the fingers. Okay, I'm going to head towards the belly now. We're going to start with the chest, with the pecs, moving our way down to the lats here on the side of the back, or on the side of the, the chest cavity here. And then we have the rectus abdominis, which runs here. Those are what we consider to be that six pack, right? Um, we also have the external oblique muscles. They go up in a diagonal section over here. Moving down the leg, here's the fasciae latte. It's going to be responsible for helping move your leg outward. Um, here we have the vastus lateralis, 
the rectus femoris, which is connected to the femur and allows us to stand erect, right? That's what it means, rectus femoris. It basically is going to be running across your entire front of your leg and connecting down towards your knee. Um, on the side here, we have the vastus medialis. Uh, we also have the adductor magnus. The adductor magnus is just a very large adducting muscle, right? So adducting means pull it back towards the midline, and you can picture that if you were to contract this muscle, it would bring this leg back inward that direction. Um, as we head down the leg, we have the gastrocnemius and the solus, the lower leg, in the front, the tibialis anterior, and the fibularis longus. Whew. All right, we're turning around now. Here's the posterior. Again, we're going to take that occipital frontalis, occipital belly is going to connect here at the occipital bone. Then we're going to move down to the sternocleomastoid, which is again going to be found kind of in the throat connecting here at the sternum. Um, the trapezius and then the deltoid, which is the cap of the shoulder, right, the nice shoulder cap muscle. Underneath that we have the teres minor and teres major as well as the infraspinatus. Um, if we're moving down the arm, we're going to end up with the tri triceps brachii, the brachioradialis, extensor digitosum, extensor carpi ulnaris, which is basically here we have the flexor carpi radialis, which is going to flex the radius. This is at the same time going to be the extensor of the ulnaris, which so these guys are going to work kind of opposite each other. Same with this one, the flexor carpi ulnaris is going to work opposite the extensor carpi ulnaris. So oftentimes you'll see we have paired muscle groups muscle groups that are for adduction and then for abduction, right? So things that are for flexing and then also the opposite muscles for extension, for example. All right, so we're moving down the leg here. We have the vastus lateralis. Here's the gracilis. This is the adductor magnus, which is the same one that we just talked about here. It's just we're seeing it from the other side now. The semitendinous running down the back. We have the biceps femoris. We actually have two biceps in our body, but nobody ever thinks about this bicep femoris. Uh, the iliotibial tract, that's called the IT band. You may have heard of that. It's going to connect your glutes down to the outside of your knee, right? Um, and then we have here the sartorius and the solus and the gastrocnemius, which are the calf muscles. Okay, so the muscles of the head, the neck, and um, are going to start here with the occipital frontalis. Again, we're going to have the frontalis region here as well as the occipitalis towards the back. Um, it's going to make that's called the epicranial aponeurosis. It's basically like a nice thin tendon sheath that's going to connect from here all the way to the back and is going to run underneath the hairline. So it's going to be this all the skin that's superior to the orbit, everything above the eyeball. It's going to allow us to raise our eyebrows, for example, give us a nice quizzical arch. As we move down, we have the occipital frontalis occipital belly that's found in the back, right? So it's found towards the back of the head. Also at the very end of the apocranial aponeurosis. Um, this will allow us to kind of draw the scalp backwards a little bit. It's not really a muscle that we utilize very much. You can't really flex it. Um, we have the orbicularis oculi, which is going to run around the orbit of the eye socket, starting at the eyelid. Its function is to close the eye or contraction, right, if you have dust around you or whatnot, if you go into water. Um, the zygomaticus major is going to run right across the zygomatic arch. It's going to basically be a cheek muscle or it goes over the cheekbones. And it's going to allow us to smile. So when you contract the edges of your corners of your mouth upward um, and, and bare your teeth in hopefully a friendly fashion, that's called smiling, right? You're going to be doing that by pulling back the zygomaticus major. Um, also, we also have the plasmata, which is going to be here. It's going to be involved in depression of your mandible, so dropping your jaw. The masseter is going to help you elevate your mandible. It's going to be involved in chewing, so it's going to help bring that chew back up. You're going to basically be going back and forth between the, zygo, um, the plasmata and the masseter over and over, so that when you're going to be basically pulling your mandible up, you use one. When you're depressing it, you use the other. And again, that's a good example of when we have two sets of muscles, one that does A and the other that does B, that are working in concert. Um, the temporalis is found on the temporal bone. It's going to be the point of insertion is the mandible, and it's going to be involved again in elevating and retracting the mandible during the process of chewing. So the masseter and the temporalis are going to be involved in that. Um, the sternocleomastoid is going to run down the neck. Origin is in the manoeuvrium and the clavicle region, and it's going to run all the way up to the occipital bone and mastoid process. It's going to allow us to move our head around. So flexion and rotation of our head is going to be done by that one there. Um, the trapezius is going to ha have a point of origin at the occipital bone, and it's going to be inserted at the clavicle, which allows our head to extend and also allows us to elevate the scapula. Picture nice making shrugging motion. It also allows us to pull our arms back. Okay. Um, all right, so as we're moving down the trunk, 
Here's the muscles of some of the trunks. So we have the pecs, the pectoralis major. Again, on the top here, on the left here, sorry, we have those superficial muscles, the ones that you'll be able to see pretty easily. And then this is going to be the deep muscles. So we'll have removed the superficial muscles so you can see the ones underneath. It's going to include the pecs. We have the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. Um, we also have the rectus abdominis, which are going to be here, right, rectus abdominis. We also have the transverse abdominis. We have the external and the internal obliques and the external and internal intercostals, which are going to run inside of our rib cage here. Um, okay, so we already kind of talked about these, but now it's going to kind of show them in a different plane. So now I've got a transverse plane showing you where they are. Here's the rectus abdominis running upward. Here's the transverse abdominis on the inside. The internal and external obliques are going to be lined up just on top of that transverse abdominis. Now, when you take a nice deep breath and then you exhale really hard, you're using three major sets of muscles. You're using the internal and the external intercostals, or the rib muscles. You're also using the diaphragm, which is what's going to be responsible for um, bringing the... So the diaphragm contracts, and that's going to pull down the thoracic cavity, which is going to decrease the pressure, pressure inside the lungs, the pleural pressure, which means that air is going to flood in from the external environment. And then when that diaphragm gets relaxed, then it's going to be, um, it's going to exhale basically and push everything out. So it's going to flatten during contraction and increase normal thoracic volume during inspiration. Okay, so during expiration or exhaling, we're going to be using the internal intercostals. Um, during, and, and, um, during the inspiration, we'll be using the external intercostals and the diaphragm. Okay, so again, on the left, we're going to have superficial. On the right, we're going to have deep, but we're going to look at all of the muscles here of the posterior trunk and the shoulder. That's going to include the supraspinatus, which is found here. Um, origin is going to be on the scapula, and its insertion is going to be on the humerus. So it's going to go down to the humerus and help basically do the, um, do the shoulder motion. It's going to help abduct the shoulder, so bring the shoulder mo uh, back down, so abduction of the arm at the shoulder. We also have the infraspinatus, which is going to be the external rotator. It's going to have the point of origin on the fossa of the scapula. Here it is. And it's going to have its um, insertion on the humerus. So again, this is going to allow us to do the rotating. It's part of your rotator cuff, if you will. Um, we have the subscapularis, which is going to be have a point of origin, again, on the scapula. And its insertion is also going to be on the humerus. And it's going to be involved in rotation of the humerus as well. So all of these are going to be involved, basically, in the shoulder joint. The teres minor um, is going to be in the, involved. It's going to be connected to the scap scapula and the lateral humerus. And its job is to hold the humerus in at the region called the glenoid cavity, which when we look at this actual shoulder joint, you'll see the glenoid cavity is going to be found right in there. And it's basically going to be the opposite side of the, um, the ball. So it's going to be in the cup side of the ball and socket joint. All right, teres major is going to be a little bit further down than teres major. It's going to be found in the lateral scapula um, and the lateral humerus, and it's going to insert on the lateral humerus. It allows us to extend and adduct the arm. That's like putting your chin up, right? Uh, like pulling a chin up, I mean, as well as medial rotation. So we also have the lats, the latimus dorsi, which are found origin originating at the spines of the ribs between um, the T5 and L5, sorry, T7 and L5. And the insertion is also going to be on the humerus. This is going to allow us to move our arms in extension at abduction, like a wide grip, for example, or like an overhand pull-up, um, as well as gives us the ability to rotate the humus, humerus internally. The deltoid is going to have an insertion on the clavicle, which again, that's going to be the collarbone. Um, and also at the scapula, and it's going to have the insertion at the humerus, which is where the deltoid tuberosity is found on the humerus. And its point is abduction, rotation of the arm, and circumduction. Okay, so these muscles are the muscles of the deep back. We have a couple different groups of these. We have the longimus group, um, longimus group, and then the iliocostal group, as well as the spinalis group, and the quadratus lumborum. Okay, these guys are all basically going to be connecting all of the different, not only the ribs, but also the vertebrae, and also all of these connections hanging off of the vertebrae to the hips. So we're going to be have a lot of different ways that the deep back is going to allow the vertebrae to hopefully stay in alignment by having these muscles holding everything in place. 
All right, let's travel down the arm. The biceps are going to be the biceps brachii. Remember, we have two sets of biceps. Biceps brachii are going to have two points of origin on the um, coracoid process uh, and also so the superior and the anterior coracoid processes are both going to be regions that hang off of the scapula. But the point is that they're going to be coming off the scapula and then they're going to go all the way down and insert at the radius. This is going to allow us to flex the forearm, i.e. bring it up like um, pulling up a set of weights, for example, as well as supination, which allows us to turn the forearm upward, like may I please have a dollar. Um, and the brachialis is going to be found here in um, origin of the lower humerus near the deltoid tuberosity, and it's going to insert here at the ulna. Its point is to flex the forearm. Triceps brachii, the point is to extend the forearm. It's going to be found at the posterior scapula, and it's going to be connected to the posterior ulna. And again, that's going to allow us to extend the forearm. All right, let's move down the leg for a bit. So here's the leg. These are our hip flexors here that are going to be involved in moving the hip around. That's the psoas major and the ilia uh, iliacus. Um, they're going to be connected at the lower vertebrae, the lumbar vertebrae, and connect into the leg. Here's the sacrum here as well. Um, here's the IT band, the iliotibial band, and that's going to connect off from the basically the glutes all the way down to the tibia. So it's going to go all the way around the knee. Um, here's the sartorius, sartorius, nice long one here. Here's the adductor longus, which allows, it's a long muscle that allows for the process of adduction. This one here that's been cut off, that's called the rectus femoris, and it's been cut so that you can see underneath, which has the vastus intermedius um, and the vastus medialis coming off of it. All of those four are considered the quadriceps. So the rectus femoris, femoris the vastus lateralis, the vastus intermedius, and the vastus medialis are all the quadriceps. And here we've got the rectus femoris tendon, which is going to be the tendon that connects the muscle, in this case the vastus rectus um, femoris tendon, into the bone itself, right? And the patella is just the knee, so it's the actual knee bone. And there's the patellar ligament, which is going to connect the knee bone down to the um, tibia. All right. Um, so let's talk about the thigh muscles. So the gluteus maximus, we're looking at the posterior thigh or the back. The gluteus maximus is going to be basically the butt muscle, the muscle that holds behind your hips. Um, the origin is going to be the ilium, which is actually from the hip itself, the ilium and the sacrum and the coccyx. Insertion is going to be in the IT band, which basically runs all the way down to the femur from the iliotibial tract. And you can picture if you were to contract this, right, it would extend, hyperextend, and rotate the thigh out. So this would be how you could, like, kick or lift your leg, right? The gluteus medinus is found originating at the ilium and inserting at the femur. So the ilium is another region of the hip. Inserted at the femur allows us to abduct and medially rotate the thigh. And we have the semitendinous, the biceps femoris, and the semimembranous, which all start at the ischium. Again, this is going to be the hip, but they end at different regions of the tibia. So the medial tibia, the lateral tibia, and the medial tibia. And this all allows us to flex the knee and extend our thigh outward. As we move our way down, we have here the soleus, the gastronemus, and the tibialis anterior. The soleus is going to originate to the proximal tibia and fibula and insert the calcineus, which allows us to have plantar flexion of the foot. Um, we also have the gastronemus, which originates at the distal femur and is going to insert at the calcineal. This is the Achilles tendon, so that's here. Um, and this is going to allow us to flex the foot and flex the knee. And then last but not least, the tibialis anterior, which is going to be the proximal tibia, which allows us dorsiflexion of the foot. Okay, so that's an overview of the different types of uh, the different muscles of the body. Um, any one of those is fair game for the exam. So yeah, you will have to go through and know most of them. That's not all of the muscles of the body, but the ones that were labeled you will need to know. Um, but let's talk about how muscles contract because, as I mentioned, it's a lot more complicated than just having the muscle. We have to have innervation of the muscle, and then the muscle has to move the bone. So some defining characteristics of skeletal muscle. Number one, it's multinucleated. It needs a lot of bosses. There's just too much going on for one boss to be in charge. It has a lot of mitochondria. What do mitochondria do? Make ATP. This cell is working super duper hard and it's going to need a lot of cellular energy. We have specialty regions called transverse tubules or T-tubules, where we've seen them here. 
T-tubules are going to run past this region called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that's going to become important when we start talking about muscle contraction, so we're not quite there yet, but we will talk about it in a minute. Now, some of these intracellular structures that we're going to talk about, again, that's the sarcoplasm, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the sarcolemma. These are all regions within the cell that are going to be involved in storing calcium and inducing the contractile event. So the sarcolemma is found at the plasma membrane, the sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm, essentially, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a region of smooth ER that's going to be involved in calcium storage and release during muscle contraction. But before we talk about the initiation of muscle contraction, let's talk about the technical well, the technical capabilities of how this works. So how does it work? We're dealing with two different types of proteins. We have a thin protein and a thick protein. The thin protein is known as actin and the thick protein is known as myosin. So again, here's the thin protein and there's the thick protein laying right over top of it, okay? Now there are these little heads here on myosin that are able to bind to actin under certain conditions, all right? So on the actin monomers, we have these myosin binding sites that are exposed under certain conditions. And then we have other types of binding molecules known as troponin, tropomyosin, et cetera, that are going to block the myosin binding sites so that myosin can't bind. All right, so under normal conditions, when nothing is present, myosin is not binding. Under relaxation conditions, myosin is not binding because it physically can't, because troponin and tropomyosin are blocking the myosin binding site on the actin region, okay? So while we are relaxed, nothing is bound, okay? When we are going to be contracting, we're going to be using our capability to bind here to pull this closer. Now that's not really shown here, but just be aware that that's how we're going to get this contracted capability. We're gonna have binding and pulling. All right, so during the relaxation, we have just a limited overlap of the thick band, myosin, and the thin band, right, actin. Just a limited amount of overlap. And that means that it's gonna be a lot longer than it is when it's con fully contracted when we push this in and pull that in. Okay, a couple other things we wanna talk about. We have the Z line, which is gonna be at the very end of one set of cells. So here's the Z line here. At the end of the sarcomere, a sarcomere is one contractile unit. So this like is, that line is the Z band, that's the Z line. Now that line is gonna be in contrast to this H zone, which is in the center like this. Well, that, I'm sorry, it's the, the A band, which is going to take this whole H zone. So the H zone is going to be the region that has only myosin and no actin, okay? And the H band is going to be wide when it's relaxed and shorten when it's contract because we're going to have a higher region of overlap, okay? We're also going to have this, what's called this I band shortening, which is the region from one myosin molecule to the next myosin molecule that goes across that Z band, and as you might imagine, as this myosin comes in and that myosin comes in, that I band is also going to shorten. But I want to be very clear that the length of the myosin molecule, which is known as the A band, that doesn't change. So the myosin molecule doesn't shorten or lengthen, neither does the actin molecule. They just are going to insert themselves further in, right? So we're going to pull it all together. Okay, so when a muscle contracts, how does it happen? So we have these specialty regions on myosin, that is myosin heads that are able to bind to the actin subunit when calcium is present. So calcium here is removing, I'll go back two slides, here's troponin and tropomyosin which are binding the myosin binding sites so that we can't have myosin binding to actin. Mind you, these are the actin, they are the myosin binding sites on the actin molecule. So this green molecule is actin. This myosin molecule in, in red is what's going to be binding. These myosin heads will be binding to the myosin binding sites if they are available. They are only available when calcium is present because calcium binds to troponin and changes the conformation. So here, when calcium is present, now we can go ahead and contract because we can have that myosin heads binding to actin. And once they bind, then they pull See, they tighten and pull, and that allows contraction. So when muscle contracts, the whole muscle shortens because the individual filaments slide across one another. But again, the actin doesn't shorten, and myosin doesn't shorten. They just get closer together. Now, shortening doesn't always occur during contraction. If, for example, you were to try to pick up a dumbbell but not actually move it, just hold it in place but lean against it, 
that one might require muscle contraction without muscle, sh muscle shortening. So the difference between isometric, concentric, and eccentric contraction are whether or not you are shortening, lengthening, or keeping the same muscle length throughout the contraction. If you picture if you're trying to pick up something really heavy, you might be giving it all your energy, but not actually shortening the muscle because you weren't actually lifting the whatever it was, right? So let's just basically say that sometimes you can lift things up while, um, while moving them forward. Like if you're holding a book in your hand, you're, could you keep it stationary? If you were keeping it stationary, that would be isometric. If you were lifting it up while you were using your weight, that would be concentric. If you were lowering it while using your weight, eccentric. So it's not always the same thing. Contraction and shortening is not always the same thing. Okay, so during muscle contraction, this is our relaxed state and this is our excited state. So during muscle contraction, we start off with troponin blocking the myosin sites, myosin binding sites on actin, right? So there's no excitation, we can't have any binding because the myosin binding complex is physically covered by troponin and tropomyosin. This is gonna lead to a relaxed state of the muscle fiber. Now, when the muscle fiber becomes excited, calcium is gonna be released. That calcium is going to bind to the troponin, pulling troponin off, and that's gonna expose the area that myosin can bind. So when myosin's able to bind to the myosin binding site on actin, it's able to cause that power stroke that's going to cause the pulling of the thin filament inward during contraction, okay? So again, it all comes down to how much calcium is present. And so we always need to have calcium in our stores, even when we're not actively using it. So we use a region called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is similar to the endoplasmic reticulum that most cells have, except it's special for muscle cells. And in this region, we're going to store calcium. So calcium is stored there until we get a signal from the nervous tissue. When that happens, it's going to release calcium, which is going to cause excitation, right, cause muscle contraction. So the tubules that are found in these T tubules here, the transverse tubules, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum are connected, and they're going to be utilizing the f calcium, which is going to be released after the nervous tissue fires. That calcium is then going to be transported out into the cytosol. Now, after this, the calcium is released in the cytosol, that causes contraction, then we have to remove that calcium back. And we do that through active transport, to pull that calcium back out to stop the muscles from firing. So the muscles aren't going to be continuously firing because calcium is present because we're moving the calcium back. So we, um, we are going to always have what we call a, a residual muscle contraction. So even when our muscles are relaxed, there's always some myosin heads that are binding and releasing actin, so we're never quite 100% relaxed. And so that gives us the muscle tone that we see underneath our skin when our muscles are still somewhat firm by a small amount of binding that's happening kind of just at a basal level. And this muscle tone is really important to prevent our muscles from overstretching, also from our joints from being overextended, helps us maintain posture, helps us move around and keep our balance. So muscle tone is super important. So what happens if your muscles start to ache? Why would they hurt? Well, number one, overexercise. If you've been using them to the point of the borderline injury or they just need repair, they might just be super tired, they might not be able to function properly. It also probably is going to have to do with dehydration. Very often you're going to have low amounts of water either after you've exercised or when you've been utilizing your muscles for a lot. So oftentimes not having enough water could be a quick way that you could alleviate those muscle cramps just by a quick chugging a glass of water. It can also be an uh, imbalance of the muscle, um, things like calcium, magnesium, uh, potassium, right, the ions between the inside and the outside of the cell. Um, so if, for example, you don't have enough calcium to fire things, then you're not going to be able to get the accurate firing. So if you're not quite able to regulate or reach homeostasis for all your mineral balance, you can also cause muscle cramps. This can also occur if we get elderly. So old age can occur and cause muscle cramps, as can injury or repetitive injury or inflammation. All right. I mentioned previously that we need the nervous tissue to be able to fire the muscles. So we use nervous cells. Nervous cells in innervate skeletal muscle fibers. These are known as motor neurons. And these guys have cell bodies that are found basically in the brain. Sometimes they're found in the spinal cord and are going to send information out. They're basically in tight conjunction with the brain and send information out to the muscles. The motor neurons that are myelinated are going to be called Schwann cells. They're the axons of those motor neurons are myelinated. They're called Schwann cells. 
And they're the largest axons in the body. And they're going to create what's called action potentials, which are electrical impulses that travel from one location to another. And they travel really fast, so at high velocity. That allows for signals to come from the central nervous system, like the brain and the central nervous system, to your skeletal muscle fibers with very minimal delay, which is important if, like, you just stepped on a sharp rock or something and you wanted to move your foot immediately or something hot, you don't want further damage to occur while you're trying to figure out what to do. So this here is the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction is going to be an area where the neurons are going to come out and innervate at the synaptic end bulb with the muscle tissue by um, excreting something called ACH or acetylcholine. It's a neurotransmitter, meaning it's a molecule that works in transmission of neurological signals. And basically what happens is when information comes down from the axon terminal, we're going to be, like an electrical impulse is going to come in. That's going to end up here, terminate at the synaptic end bulb, where we're going to have calcium that's going to be coming back in. When the voltage-gated calcium channels open, that's going to cause a release of acetylcholine. When acetylcholine is released across the synaptic cleft, synapse is just the connection between the muscle cell here and the nervous cell here, and synaptic cleft is just the hole between those two, right? As things go across that synaptic cleft or the space, then they're going to get picked up here at the junctional fold. When we have ACH binding to that ACH receptor, that's going to cause the nervous impulse, okay? Again, that's going to happen at a region called the neuromuscular junction at the synaptic end bulb, but a region that's going to be found um, at the, the motor end plate, essentially, the end of the motor cell. So once ACH is going to be released, then it binds to regions on that receptors, basically, on the motor end plate that open ion channels. When they open the ion channels, we end up with a quick depolarization. What does that mean? So polarized versus depolarized or hyperpolarized are all just going to refer to levels of electrical concentration on the inside relative to the outside. So depolarization means that we're going to have an electrical impulse because we have a very strong difference between the inside and the outside of the cell that's then going to get transmitted or pushed down the cell called end plate potential. And these are always going to be excitatory. That means they're always going to be turning on. Sometimes we have inhibitory prosynaptic potentials, but we're not going to have that from the end plate potential. So excitatory means it's always going to be turning things on as opposed to turning things off. Okay, so what is a neuromuscular junction? The neuromuscular junction is a region where the neurons are going to innervate the muscle fiber. They're found in the middle of the muscle fiber, and that's going to cause an action potential or an electrical impulse to spread out from the neuromuscular junction along the entire muscle cell in both directions. Okay, so we can end up with a, an action potential that causes an electrical, um, sorry, an excitatory impulse. Um, and then sometimes we can end up with a twitch, basically, is what's happening. So let's go ahead and take a look here. If we have acetylcholine coming and being released at the synaptic end bulb, it'll be picked up at the neuromuscular junction because we have acetylcholine-gated receptors, which are going to be channels for cations that can then send information. When that information comes in, then we're going to release, so it's going to trigger an action potential in the muscle fiber which causes the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Remember the transverse tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum are all going to be connected. So when that calcium channel opens, the calcium is going to flood out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When it does that, it's going to initiate contraction. How? Well, when we don't have calcium, we have troponin bind. But bound, but when calcium comes in, it removes troponin because calcium is bound. And when calcium binds, the myosin cross bridge from act, it can bind to the actin site, the myosin binding site on actin, and contract. So when it binds, then it causes this contractile event, which is called the power stroke. Then it detaches and does it again. So basically, it's just going to catch and pull and catch and pull and catch and pull until it's fully contracted. Okay, and then that's when we're going to end up with a full like, contractile event. And then eventually, we're going to end up releasing the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that's going to end up ending the muscle contraction. Okay. So there are three different types of skeletal muscle fibers that are going to be better or worse at particular types of exercise. So these guys that are the darker fibers, these are going to be slow oxidative fibers. They're slow twitch fibers. And basically, they work for things that you could do for a long period of time, walking all day, hiking, right? Now, if you want to do something intermediate like running, you could do running for a reasonable amount of time, maybe not as long as walking, but certainly longer than sprinting, right? That would be involving intermediate muscle fibers, which are both fast, fast oxidative and glycolytic. 
And if we're using the muscle fibers for quick sprints or activities that are immediate, like boxing matches or whatever, that are going to need a lot of energy in a really short period of time, an explosion of energy, those are going to be fast twitch muscle fibers. And basically the difference between the two is are they using, well, how are they getting ATP? Are they using oxidative phosphorylation? which is going to give us a really long, sustainable drip of energy, or they're using glycolysis, which is going to give us a burst of energy, but we might run out of it quickly. Or are we doing both, right? So this intermediate is going to have a little bit of both, so we can have that slow trickle as well as that quick flood of energy. So again, that's just the difference in how they're utilizing their energy, whether it's going to be more of a longer, sustainable energy or a quick burst. So how do we remember the muscle fibers, right? If you think of a chicken, right, you think of dark meat versus white meat, right? The legs are the dark meat. They're the red fibers. They're slow fibers. They're using oxygen. They have myoglobin, more blood vessels, more mitochondria, et cetera. They're always walking around. That's the slow walk thing, right? That's the dark meat. Now the light meat is for the breast tissue. Why? Because occasionally they flap, but they flap for like 50 seconds to a minute trying to get somewhere fast, but they're really not even going to be able to fly, and eventually they're going to give up. So the breast is the white meat. It's for quick, fast fibers, anaerobic with less blood flow, and they have, they're going to use glycogen. So that's kind of the difference between, like I said, the white or the dark meat. So this is the white meat here, the breast tissue for the quick flight. This is the dark meat here, the thighs for the walking around. Okay, so here we've got the, the dark meat, right, for the type 1s, the slow twitch fibers. These guys are much smaller. They have a, a lot of mitochondria, but the mitochondria are obviously large. Um, and they're going to appear red because we have a lot of myoglobin, so they're going to be darker. The ATP is going to be generated through aerobic respiration as opposed to anaerobic respiration, right? So it's going to be a longer, sustainable energy source. And they're going to resist fatigue because we're going to be able to utilize this energy for a longer period of time. It's associated with endurance activities, right, something that's going to be an all-day affair. Again, this is the, the walking around part of the chicken or the dark meat. Now, fast glycolytic fibers are the opposite of that. These are fast twitch fibers. Um, these guys are actually going to be um, kind of in between. So these are going to have both the ability to use glycolysis to be generated as well as, um, so fast glycolytic fibers are going to use glycolysis as well as a little bit of the um, of the aerobic respiration. And the fatigue is going to happen very quickly, but we're going to get our power very quickly too. So contraction and relaxation are going to be pretty fast. Short bursts of power, right? So this is going to be for like rapid reactions with short bursts of speed. Um, okay, they have these backwards here. I just wanted to show you that this here has this running, and this actually should be for the sprinting and this one should be for running so we should have done this this is the moderate resistance this one has a little bit of both but the images are backwards here so i should have edited that i apologize anyway these guys are intermediate size um, these are going to appear a little bit red because they have large amounts of um, myoglobin they generate atp by both aerobic respiration and glycolysis so these are actually going to be the runners not the splinters a little bit in between and they're associated with middle distance style running and i'm going to go backwards now and talk about this should be the sprinting and these guys are going to be for the fast, um, fast release of energy. They're going to do it pretty mainly through glycolysis, quick surge of power for really fast, sporty type of sprinting exercises. Okay. So all muscles are going to have one or the other, but they're mainly all going to have a mix of both, but all of them are going to have more of one than the other. And everybody's muscle type is going to depend both on their training and their genetics. But in general, certain muscles are going to be um, fast twitch and certain muscles are going to be slow twitch. Good examples are going to be if someone's doing like um, uh, doing a lot of running, for example, that's going to be areas of their legs, their glutes, their shoulders, et cetera. Um, some slow fibers are going to be found in endurance athletes, more in like the lower back, the, the chewing muscles and, and, um, and the legs and the calves. Then different exercises can cause different skeletal muscle fibers to become more or less of either type. So weight training is going to make stronger muscles that are um, increased in fiber diameter, have a lot of myofibrils. Um, they're also going to be able to increase how much ATP they create via glycolysis, like the fast ones, as well as neuronal control and recruitment. 
Um, and endurance exercise, more like um, cross-country skiing, et cetera, are going to increase your blood vessels and the amount of mitochondria. Again, mitochondria are going to be involved in cellular respiration. So being able to take the end product of glycolysis and run it through the aerobic respiration pathway. These guys aren't going to have as much muscle size or strength as like weight trainers, but they're going to be able to last longer and have more endurance, perhaps move faster as well. Okay, so why do we need these these different types of fibers, right? So exercise is really important because it provides these different fibers for us. And these fibers are involved in our bone density, which is going to be involved in the staving off osteoporosis. They're also going to strengthen our, um, our muscles, increasing our balance and coordination, going to end up with the production of what we call oxytocin and serotonin. These are all good mood hormones. They all make you feel better, um, which can also be involved in some, preventing things like mild depression, etc and reducing stress and inflammation in the body. And it also can help reduce certain long-term diseases like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. So they say that if you're pre-diabetic, one of the best things that you can do is moderate your diet and exercise to try to stave off becoming diabetic, right? And same thing with cardiovascular disease. Like when you're told that you have high cholesterol and you have an increased cardiovascular problem or cardiovascular risk, you can offset that by changing your diet and increasing your exercise routines. Okay, again, exercise is really important in muscle metabolism, and it's going to rely on ATP, which is our cellular energy. ATP is going to um, have multiple functions involved in muscle fiber contraction and relaxation, but basically ATP is going to be able to be utilized in many ways. The first is being able to be phosphorylated by creatine phosphate. So if we take ADP, which is the lower energy version, and we want to make it ATP, which is the higher energy version, we can do it by adding free phosphate to it. But we also need energy as well. So creatine phosphate is a quick storage molecule. It's kind of like a reload mechanism that holds that extra phosphate so that when the ADP, ATP molecule goes down to the ADP, we can reload it immediately by creatine phosphate. We can also do oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria of ADP into ATP, which happens during aerobic respiration. Um, which needs oxygen, oxidative, phosphorylation needs oxygen. Um, and then we can also phosphorylate ADP another way via the glycolytic pathway in the cytosol. So basically these are three different ways that we can take DP or diphosphate and pop that third phosphate on to get it to its high energy version or ATP. Now, if we're going to have a quick burst of energy, like a quick run or whatnot, we have to like fight or flight for a second, we're going to get through our energy stores of ATP very, very quickly. Just a few seconds of actually stored up right there inside our cells. And so we're going to need a quick and dirty reload mechanism. And as I mentioned, creatine can also go from the high and low energy form. So creatine phosphate is a high energy form, and creatine by itself is a low energy form. So when muscles are relaxed, ATP is constantly delivering the extra phosphate to creatine, going from ATP to ADP. So when it does that, then it can go and get another one by regular processes and get reloaded until we are both reloaded up all the ATP as well as all the creatine molecules into creatine phosphate, right? Once creatine phosphate is loaded, it can wait for ATP to deliver its phosphate, which will happen during muscle contraction in the first couple of seconds. All the ATP molecules are going to go out and deliver their energy and come back as ADP. And creatine phosphate can then deliver its phosphate over, going back to its creatine version, basically reloading ATP, giving it another couple of seconds that it can sustain muscular energy, muscular contraction. But after a couple of minutes, glycogen is going to be utilized to be able to produce glucose. And then we're going to utilize glucose as our primary energy surge for about the half, first half hour. So glucose being sugars, now we can get that from simple sugars or we can get that from carbohydrates. But then after about 30 minutes of moderate activity, we're going to start lip lipogenesis. I'm sorry, lipolysis, which is fat breakdown. Lipogenesis is lip, lip fat creation. I used the wrong word. So lipogenesis is the breakdown of fats. And that happens, again, about the 30-minute mark. So this is why if you're trying to actually lose fat tissue, you want to make sure that you get aerobic respiration for about 30 to 45 minutes because they are not even going to touch it for the first half hour. Um, however, if we do have high intensity short duration activities like sprinting, weightlifting, etc., we will end up burning fat because we'll be using glycogen for that and glycogen stores have to be replaced afterwards. And when we do that, we're probably going to use fat via the liver to help, not fat from the liver, but the liver is going to break down fat to help replace that glycogen that we've utilized. Okay, so glycolysis is the very first step in cellular respiration and it's anaerobic. It does not require oxygen. 
Um, but when you are, so when you run out of breath and you're not using oxygen anymore, you're requiring the pathway to be anaerobic. And anaerobic respiration isn't going to produce as much energy as aerobic respiration. Um, aerobic respiration is going to be produ producing about tenfold the amount of ATP as aerobic respiration. All right, so in our muscle, we're going to be undergoing a meta metabolic pathways that are constantly breaking down glycogen to make glucose or creating glycogen, so depending on how much glucose we have. So we're constantly breaking down glycogen to make glucose and glucagon, or if we've eaten too much glucose, we're using that glucose to build up glycogen in the liver and muscles. Um, we can also use fat to make glycogen. So glycogen is a way that we can store, it's like an alternative form of glucose, like the pantry versus like what we're actually using today. So these are f food stores of glucose that we can break down in the future. We can also use fats to break down. So lipolysis is when we break down fats. And that happens as we're entering into the Krebs cycle, which is also part of cellular respiration. And we can also create new glucose, gluconeogenesis. And usually we do that by breaking down other biomolecules, such as fat, to produce glucose. And when we're breaking fat down during periods of fasting, meaning that we're not actually giving our body any new food for this time frame, so we're breaking down the fat that's in our body, um, we can off-gas what's called ketones, so when you're the, you've heard of the keto diet, right? The keto diet is the goal is to get to the point where you're breaking down fat. And you don't break down fat until you've burnt through the carbohydrate sources that we're utilizing first. So that's going to be the first 30 minutes or so. Okay, so if we're looking at fat retention or weight loss or weight gain, it all comes down to, I don't want to call it a simple equation because it's not the same for every individual, but it really comes down to calories in calories out. So if you wanted to burn more calories, you will have to exercise more. However, individuals that are younger, males, uh, people who are typically more physically active than others, or those that have a really uh, well-working thyroid, they're going to respond more to burning calories from physical energy, like through actual exercise, than individuals who are older, are female, are typically more sedentary, and might have a hormonal imbalance. Some of the benefits of exercise include increasing your bone density, strengthening your muscles, um, increasing balance and coordination, like think like dancing, right? Um, it also is going to increase the amount of hormones that are released into your body, like oxytocin and serotonin. These are all good mood hormones that make you feel better. And they're going to increase your immune response, which is going to decrease your inflammation, and it might increase your ability to stave off a foreign attack. Um, and also, it's going to decrease your risk of heart disease by just getting the blood flowing and pumping more often, stabilizing your blood sugars. And last but not least, it might help with cellular regeneration by stimulating hormones that might help with regeneration and repair, because typically, muscles or it might be a little bit weakened after exercise and so the body automatically goes back and checks on them to make sure that they're um, becoming you know, regenerated and so they can stimulate hormones that can help with cellular regeneration and repair. As we get older, our muscle fiber diameter decreases. It takes longer for us to recover after exercise. Um, we produce less glucagon, and glucagon is responsible for breaking down glycogen, so now we can't access the food in the pantry as easily. Um, we're going to have reduced circulating sex hormones, less testosterone, less estrogen, less IGF, and that's all going to affect muscle recovery tone and re recovery time as well as muscle tone. And our nervous system isn't going to have the same response time that it saw previously. We might have slower reflexes, um, et cetera. So because our nervous system isn't telling our muscles to fire as quickly as it was in our youth, we might end up with reduced strength, balance, and coordination, as well as the possibility of loss of dexterity, and that could increase the injury risk, et cetera. So as we get older, it becomes more difficult for us to maintain some of the things that might be um, kind of a no-brainer in our youth. All right, so here's the answer to the application question. When we are doing a squat, we use our quads, our hamstrings, our glutes, our solus and gastrocnemius, our abs and erector spinae, and exercise is going to be considered anaerobic and high intensity for a short duration. Um, exercise with weights, I mean. So we're going to be using primarily fast twitch fibers, which use creatine phosphate as a quick fuel source, and then use glucose to break down glycogen. All right, 
So I'll give you a moment to read through the rest of what was written on this page. Here is your application answer. And this will wrap us up for this lecture. I really appreciate you coming to class today. And I will see you all on Lecture 7B. Have a fabulous day and happy studying.